Maxwell and Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well. And I hope you're enjoying the 50 Most Relevant for 2023. The series is almost done. Today, we're at number seven. Will Ashcroft is who we're having a conversation about. Our last cash cow for the 50 Most Relevant. Some think maybe he should have been at number one, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, throughout this episode. It's been a minute since we've had Kane back on the podcast, so we had to get him back inside these final few. Hello, buddy. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, MJ. I knew you'd get me back on with a guy that's got a bit more of a keeper lens to him because yes. I heard the tease yesterday on the podcast and I thought, okay, I have a pretty good idea who MJ's talking about here. And I thought, I don't know how we're going to fill in you know, the roughly 20, 25 minutes we normally <laughs> get on these podcasts with a salary cap perspective. So I've done a bit of thinking about a keeper sense, but uh, let, let's tackle the salary cap format because yeah, we know that is really what, these lists and his 50 most relevant is based off of. 100%. 18 year old Brisbane Lions midfielder goes as a father son super early on draft day. There was some thought that maybe the Giants would make the Brisbane Lions pr- pay a full price for him. It got pretty close to full price, but it didn't. They ended up opting and weren't going for Cadman at number one. As a result, I suppose it's a benefit for us as fantasy coaches. We get a fraction of a discount based on what we could have been paying for. 202800 in Supercoach. 298 in AFL Fantasy. 295400 in Dream Team. No 2022 data to talk about from an AFL level, purely because he is coming to us from elite junior numbers. And I think, Kane, to talk about him, yes, we could wrap up this podcast quickly. He's the best midfielder in the draft. He's the number one cash cow. Just go get him. But there's a lot of reasons for why the community is so excited about him, isn't there? He's one of the most well-rounded midfielders to come out of the draft. While not tall in stature, his reputation is as big as anyone. Um, strong in the contest, quick, clean, powerful, good user of the ball, really neat skill set of left and right, makes good decisions all of the time, brings his teammates into the game, creates separation, makes things happen when it's just not seemingly being done. If there's a pack, Ashcroft is at the bottom of it, either with the ball or around the guy that's got the ball applying defensive pressure. He is every bit as good as the last couple of elite midfielders we've had through. And my goodness me, I don't think there's many salary cap teams that are brave enough to not even think about not selecting Will Ashcroft this year. Ah, spot on, MJ. You look at the junior pedigree first, it's off the charts. It's as good as we've seen, you know, averaging mid-35 disposals a game. Like That's just outrageous at every level, NAB League, national champs, just dominated. And you throw in the fact that he actually got to play three games for Brisbane in the VFL, and he averaged 103 in those three yeah. games. You know, against guys that he's going to be lining up with now, it's just super, super impressive for an 18 year old to be doing that. Not just, you know, one, you're playing in a team you've never played in before, you're rarely training with these guys, and you slot in, you're going at 27 touches a game, three marks, five tackles, kick two goals across those three games. Like, it's just so well rounded. And that's what's so impressive about him. It's not just well rounded in scoring, but it's well rounded in the way that he accumulates that score, as you mentioned, inside, super clean, super tenacious. But he also does have a bit of that burst to get away yes. from a contest and clear that sort of congestion and set up the play for his team. So it's ultra impressive. Um, you know, He would have been worthy of a number one pick, but we yep. know with the way the situation fell with the father-son, he's given us a little bit of a discount, You know, 2K in AFL Fantasy, but it all does add up. Yeah, every think, few thousand dollars works, yeah. Yeah, but also, MJ, I think the other thing that's that makes him so interesting and so important and so obvious for so many coaches is the situation. Because this yeah. is the Brisbane team that, for mine, um, they've got a lot of names in that midfield. They do. But I think they haven't really settled 
last year on what that centre bounce mix is. We know that Lockie Neal's a constant. We know that Josh Dunkley's come in and we believe he's going to be a bulk centre bounce player. He provides something a bit different. He's a bit taller. He's very physical. He's good in the air, can go forward and take a mark. But we did see a regression from Jared Lyons. You know, I know he's been battling some injuries last year that held him back, but he's also 30-plus mm-hmm. now. McCluggage, you know, he got a fair chunk of CBAs. He was at, at 55%, yeah. but it maybe wasn't that leap that we were expecting. There was there was pockets and there was stretches when he was at an elite level, but he does seem to, whether it's a team thing, get pushed out to the wing or just drift in and out of games. And then below that, there are guys that if you want to push to that top, top tier, mm. I think – you either need to look past or you need to just find a different role from the team. You know, you think about Matheson and Robertson. Yeah. They just, they come in, they do bits and pieces, but they don't ever move the needle. I thought Jared Berry's final against Melbourne was sensational. Oh, it's, it's but then again, you look at the role he played, you know, he goes around two, 72% CBAs, 64%, that's at 44% and then 62%. Mm. And then he's, he's getting zero or at best in the high 20s all the way until that final against Melbourne where he had 59% and then in the final the next week he's 29. So he hasn't consolidated that role where he's a 55, 60% CBA guy and no, bringing no. that consistent level. He often gets put on the outside, he's bits and pieces all over the ground. So me, for me, Ashcroft is a guy that can walk straight in and take on 50 plus percent of CBAs, you know, allow a guy like Rayner to stay forward. You know, did that experiment really work? Probably how they hoped. Now he's coming off an ACL. I thought he was sure. better he was as fine. the year went on, but it wasn't as dynamic as I think they thought using the likes of Rayner, Bailey and Zorko through that midfield. It wasn't, you know, earth shattering to opponents. I think Rayner and Bailey keep them inside 50 for the bulk of it. Yes, they can push up. Totally. But they're so dangerous in there. And that's such a strength of Brisbane, isn't it? They've always been a really high-scoring team. Yeah. And they've got so many targets up forward. I just think, let those guys do that. You know, they're so dangerous in the Ford 50. Zorko, where does he play? It seems like it's at a half-back or a half-forward yep. now. It seems like McCluggage and Barry are more wingmen that play bits and pieces. Fair. So for me, there's a void there where Ashcroft can come in in the first season – with this scoring pedigree and actually play a role that he's played in juniors. Cause we know MJ, that's often the hard thing with these rookies, isn't it? Even the ones that have massive numbers. Yeah, correct. It's very hard to walk in and get that same opportunity at a junior level. They're in at every center bounce. They're yeah. the star player. They're the one that their team. Well, there was a game for. last year in the NAB league where he had 51 disposals. So as an accumulator, he's got no problems. He averaged 29 disposals in his three VFL games last year. Um, he averaged 30 plus disposals in 11 of his, he had 30 plus disposals in 11 of his 14 averaged mid thirties in both the Vic Metro championships in the national champs and in NAB league for Sandringham Dragons. So the reason these stat lines, sometimes with juniors, we can get carried away and Kane's beautifully articulating it for us is because they've got the role. What we're highlighting is two reasons for why the community are rightfully so excited. There is a narrative and room for him to get the role to really pick up points. And there's probably probably two, you could say three, but probably two really high-end midfielders that we've had that have come in with comparable junior pedigree to him, and I'm alluding to Sam Walsh and Nick Dacos, really over the past four or five years. And both of these guys in their first seasons came in and found a role. Walsh is a center bounce mid. Dacos was redeployed. Uh, as a halfback flanker, but was often pushing up the ground and was still very much involved in and through the midfield. This is a lot of the reasons of why people are excited because you look at their two debut seasons, Walsh goes a 93 in Dream Team and Fantasy. He goes an 87 in Supercoach. Multiple tons across the formats for both of these guys and minimal scores, sub 70 and 80. This is important for our cash generation. While for Nick Dacos, seven tons last year in Dream Team and Fantasy, including a 147. While in Supercoach, six tons 
for him across the year. These are both players that could have been if things went not the way you'd hoped. If you got stuck with them at an M8 or a Dacos at D6 by the end of the year, it's not the end of the world. And so the the narrative of junior pedigree stepping into a team, as Keynes beautifully talked about, that there is room and space for him to accumulate at the senior level. And he's already done it at the halfway house at VFL. This is why he's so desired to be owned. It's not, oh, he's a good player. It's everything cascades. And then the pressure of previous performing high-end mids means there's probably an over-yoking almost of excitement about how good he could be. Well, that's the other thing, MJ. You look at other guys, even like Noah Anderson. In his mm. first season, you know, he's about the 73 mark in DT, 76 in Supercoach. He was getting 18% of center bounces. Yeah. So this is a guy that, you know, for mine, I'd be shocked if Ashcroft is below 40%. Yeah. I just think they could have used him last year. Yeah. And I think he's going to shoot past pretty much all those mids outside of Dunkley, Neal, and possibly Lions. I just really think that McCluggage is going to have to play on the wing. I think yep. he can make that his own. I think he's so damaging out there as well that you know, he would obviously get his lion's share, but uh, that's where Ashcroft's at his best. Now, you've got to protect him to a degree because it is a big step up, but this is a team that's pushing for the now. They've got so many pieces. They've invested so much in the now, and it does feel like the timing's right for a lot of their players. You know, It would be a really tough blow if in three years' time <laughs> You know, we see the back end of of Neil. We see, you know, Harris Andrews. We see a Joe Danaher, a Charlie Cameron. Um, these are all super, super players when they're up and going in their respective positions. So mm. um, the times now, and I think, you know, in that sense, unlike the Gold Coast who are saying, let's gradually build these guys in, I think it's whoever's best is going to play. Yeah. And that's another thing with, which that's huge with Ashcroft is, he was out of school last year. He was a professional footballer last year without being on an AFL list. He was all footy. He was all preparing to be on an AFL list. And as I said, yeah. he got a taste of VFL. He got to train with Brisbane throughout the year. He got to do all these things and get his routine and habits like a footballer. You can't tell me he doesn't know, didn't know last year. How do you guys structure your week? What do you do on this day? What do you do on this day? How do you recover? So, those are all little advantages. And we haven't even factored in that he's got a dad that yeah, was a highly <laughs> successful player as well and Himself, known as a yeah. fitness freak. So those are all just little edges that make that transition yeah. so much easier to, to a club. So for me, I think he's a piece that Brisbane really, really needed. You know, To bring in a Dunkley is huge, but to get one who's starting his journey that is so, so talented already, uh, like the time is just now for Brisbane. Like it's there's no time to be... Stop you don't get and- Gunston, you don't get McKenna, you don't make the moves they've made over the past three years. And I think you're right. The time is now for them. If Let's find the one, there are two narratives of why you wouldn't start Ashcroft. One is pretty clear and simple. For some reason, he's not named round one. And I think suspension or injury is the only compelling way I could see that take place everything coming out of the club and rightfully so they're talking him up but when you do watch them play whether it be intra club um, and we'll get to see him in the flesh against other teams over the coming weeks you're like okay yeah i see why this kid's so good the only reason i'm not saying it's the right reason but the only reason i could have any sense of yay to not pick him and this is really clutch against straws came is there becomes such a plethora of cash cows that are considerably cheaper that you believe have equal scoring potential and equal job security. Because with him being priced at the top of level, he needs to outperform these basement cows by 15 to 20 points per game to generate the same amount of dollars to make it worthwhile. Now, Dacos did that. Walsh did that. For a couple of games, Rao did that. But you brought up a Noah Anderson. If you paid, quote unquote, up for him, you probably paid for the job security. 
but it probably wasn't as merited or worthwhile a selection if there was substantial enough cows. So that's the only reason I think you would go off Ashcroft. Now, I don't think that level of cow exists, but that's the only way is he must, as a more expensive cow, must score higher to generate the same amount of income as a basement guy. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Obviously, in AFL fantasy, when your bottom is 200k and he's you know just under 300, it's a bit easy to pick him there. Whereas you know you contrast to a super coach, yeah, when the basement is near half his price, <laughs> that's where those things do get. You know, again, if they if they're there and they click and they're at that basement price, which is only going to become more pre- prevalent. You'd think with the SSP guys often being brought yeah. in for a reason, especially if they're mature age, like a Nick Martin, um, you know, obviously a guy like a Mark, of, you know, won't be at that bottom price due to his no. history in the league, but those things will pop up and present opportunities and chances. So it's very slim that we get that volume of cows that we don't need an Ashcroft, because then again, I still think he's going to perform at a level and generate enough cash to be worth it. I don't do um, But you know, in some formats, if there's enough there or if you're enough mid-price madness that you don't think you need that volume of cows, and we know what happens, MJ, those days before the first teams come out and as the round progresses, people go, oh, 10K <laughs> here, 60K there. Yeah. Crazy things do happen. But I, I would be shocked if everyone who's playing the game seriously doesn't have Ashcroft in their team. My, what's my expectation? I feel like 75 is the basement. I think that's fair. I think he gets to the low 80s. I just think the world of this this kid already, I just think he's going to bring so much to the team. Um, and I think Brisbane need it. I, I just think, yeah, unfortunately, unless we see a Jared Berry become a consistent footballer in that midfield, unless we see Lions be able to bounce back. Again, no, he was dealing with some injuries, but... It, it wasn't looking pretty. He wasn't impacting the game to the degree that we know. And when you're at that real pointy, pointy end, yeah. sometimes it does take a kid. You saw what Dacos just brought to that Collingwood team last year, the confidence, you know, the desire just to make things happen. Like yeah. he was just fearless at times, MJ, with what he would do, how he'd position himself and just his ability to back himself and execute. And I, I do think Ashcroft is at that type of level. Again, you couple that with opportunity. If, if he was at a Fremantle, if he was at a Carlton and Melbourne, Melbourne yeah. and you go, hey, there's four Where's or the five mix? guys that yeah. are, you know, 150 plus games at the level. If you look at a Melbourne, Carlton's got a few of those guys that are 100 plus. Yeah. Fremantle's got some some young stars in Brasher and Sarong with guys like Rody that's a mature body, O'Meara, five. two really good rucks. Yeah. You know, you're down the pecking order, but, but yeah. I truly believe he could come in and be – that third or fourth centre bounce guy and make something happen. I, yep. I really, really do. So um, I think you'd be crazy to to deviate unless he's the most you've got a crystal owned. ball and know something yeah. that we don't. Look, he's the most owned guy in the formats. And and, and I don't see that it's changing. Warranted. Um, because everything about the narrative of him is warranted. Uh, I, I had did an episode, uh, joined uh, the guys at the Jock Reynolds podcast uh, a couple of days ago, and they're doing some great stuff. Wherever you find your podcast, you can go and stream what they do for super coaches. And I was on that episode, and someone was asking a question about looking for a point of different cash cow. And um, Damo, who was one of the hosts, made this beautiful point, or Clarky, I can't remember which one. Uh, shout out to both of your boys. And he just said, you're not looking for point of difference in your cash cows. You're looking for cash generation. So don't overcomplicate the game. Pick the best that are going to do that. And Ashcroft is that. It's why he's 60 plus percent ownership. It's why he will be an on-field cash cow. It's why even if he starts with a 60 and a 60, people will not deviate off him because he appears to be the best cash generation option that we know at this point in time of the year, and understandably so. And it, MJ, even if he's not the best, as we said, you're going to need, let's just even go flying through the benches. You know, you're going to need eight there. That's eight players he's on your bench that are rookie price. Mm-hmm. You're probably going to want another, I'd say at least 
five to six to seven on field. Yep. You're going to have 15 rookies mm-hmm. better than him. Come on now. It, it's just not going to happen. So, Like we said at the it, top, we, we really could have made this 30-second episode, which was pick him. Uh, number six yep. is tomorrow, but but we wanted to give you a little bit more undercurrent underneath the surface of mindset, thought process, conversations. Let's talk MJ, about maybe that is a factor if you're a fan of a McCluggage or you're yeah, a sure. fan of a Berry or a Lions. Like this is a guy that I do think is going to have a sizable chunk of this midfield role. I do too. Yeah. It's going to disrupt other things in terms of who gets in there because I just yeah. think, frankly, I do think he's better. Now, is he going to be consistent the whole year? But no, he's a kid. At his price, I think this is the type of thing you hear is like if you've got guys that are doing sixes and sevens, that can only get you so far. Now, this might be a guy that starts out at a four or five, but his potential is a nine or ten. And if he gets that going in the back half of the season and in particularly in finals when they're making their push, I think that's where Brisbane's at. I think that's why they – well, they got this guy, fell into (laughs) their lap. But you throw a Dunkley in – and you're going, Boston. this is the type of stuff. We know we can kick goals. Yep. We know when everyone's healthy in defense and Harris Andrews, if he gets back to his best, he's probably a victim of his own high performance three or four years ago. Totally. But he's still a quality defender. There's enough run and drive. And I think now, MJ, it feels deep, doesn't it? That Brisbane yeah. squad. It feels, it feels like it's 32, great. 35 deep where you go, okay, there's some young guys that have had a taste. There's yep. some guys like McKenna that have shown they can play. Yep. There's some guys, you know, that have been in and out of that team. You feel like if you don't even have to use a Matheson or a Devin Robinson in your midfield and those Amazing. guys are a coverage, that's probably how you get through a 24-round season now. So yeah. um, he's a fascinating player and it's fascinating what it's going to do to that Brisbane team because it feels like it's now or never for them. It really yeah, does. it really is. Uh, on draft day, normally in a single-season draft, First year players aren't really considered. They're, they're late stocking stuffers in the end at best. However, again, the Dacos and Walsh contrast will be front of mind for coaches. Walsh became someone you were happy to put on field year round in his debut year. Dacos became probably someone's D2 by the end of the season. Absolutely loving it. So normally it would be in the late teens to 20s on draft and a single season. Can, do we see people reach inside the top 10 rounds for him, or is that still too early? Where Give us a round spot or a midfield spot you'd feel happy to take Ashcroft, knowing full well if you want him, you are going to have to reach for him in a single season, and then we'll talk keepers in a sec. Yeah, I don't think that the first 10 rounds, MJ, you'd be inclined there, unless the first away 10 rounds is an, eight, is an 18 it. team league, but if we're sticking with the 10-team league as we normally do, I think that's a bit of a reach. Yep. Um, you know, Because for mine, you'd almost need it to be you know, five defenders, seven mids, one ruck and five forwards on field to make him you know, quite worthwhile. We know a lot of people do play you know, a lot shallower than that where it's only four mids. Um, but mm. for me, I think you know, I've got him in those low 80s. So for me, with the way it usually works out, by the time you get to the 70th mid, they're in the low to mid 70s by that point. So he's really wrestling as an M6. Yeah. Now, when do you normally take your sixth mid with everything else that's going on? It's probably not until the 12th, 13th round when you're sort of rounding that out. Yeah. Um, maybe a fraction earlier, you know, if you're going a bit stronger in the mid. So for me, that's probably where I feel comfortable is about the 12th round. Yeah, and probably what I'm hoping for there is that he actually starts forward, picks up some back. DPP. It's probably yeah. more likely Ford gets the DPP, and then is an AD guy because if he's an AD guy with Ford status, in particular, well, he's serious. probably worth more of a, a seventh or sixth round even to be honest. Because if he's producing that at the back half of the season, you know he can he can go with those types of guys like a Golden and get in that type of range. So. That's your real wishful thinking. I think, you know, MJ, you'd feel a lot better, wouldn't you, if he's a bench guy. If oh, he's, 100%. If he's your eighth, if he's your eighth, if he's your eighth mid and you sort of just have a look, see how he goes, you can always get those mids that are just solid 75 to 80s. Uh, I wouldn't mind taking him just for the potential that if he does go 85 to 90. Yeah. But again, I wouldn't, 
I'd be probably grabbing another guy that's just sort of a boring type of pick. You know, an Isaac Smith in the past where they're just totally. low 80, you can play them. Ed Kerno was that perfect guy for perfect years, option. MJ, that you just drop him in there. Um, there's never much of an upside. There's no. never, he's always overlooked, but Pops at least you know ceiling. you put him on the field. Yeah, and, and you're happy there. So there is a path to something really good if it's forward status and the CBAs grow. Yeah. But again, you don't really want to be banking on that. Even if it is a deeper league, I just think yeah. you need a bit more stability because you start getting to that range, MJ, and there's even guys like you know Dylan Stevens. Well, Jacob Jeremy Hopper's Sharp. probably still around in that early teens part, potentially. Exactly. Like, like Hopper's a guy so, that I'd feel much better with, just the yeah. new club, the, the, the health and all those type of things that he seems like he's going. So that's where it gets hard with an Ashcroft, yeah. um, especially when you feel like it's hard to go above 90. Like, if that's where your, your ceiling is. It's hard for most cows in their first year to go 90 plus. Toby Green did it. Um, Sam Walsh, at least in one of the formats, did it. So it, it's on the rarer side of things. So for me, it's a look, if he falls in the right range for me in a single season draft, I'm happy to jump. But keepers is interesting. We don't normally touch on keeper leagues in these, but we're talking about Will Ashcroft. We've already done a good job of covering a 30-second podcast well <laughs> and truly deeper than we needed to. But um, a, a contrast point, Nick Dacos, both you and I would say he's in the in the top 10 first picked in a startup keeper league right now. So he's gone yep. from someone that redrafts, probably would have taken it number one last year, Start up keeper leagues. Okay, maybe picks 40s, 50s, 60s, 80, 100. Depends on how people, you know, rank their draft boards. Ashcroft in a redraft, barring something sensational falling into the player pool, will probably be a keeper league's number one choice again this year. The reason I mentioned Dacos is he goes from a brand new league. He goes from the you know, middle of a decent spot to now he's a first rounder. My question is this, for a startup keeper league, because I just covered where I think he goes in a redraft of a keeper league. He's pick one every day of the week, unless something stupid like, even then, if Took Miller's on the board, like you've got a pretty good decision to make and no one's dumb enough to drop Took Miller. So the question is, Kane, brand new keeper league. You know what you believe Will Ashcroft could be? Which round in a 10-team Five back, seven mids, one ruck, five forwards. Give me a ballpark range where you're happy to take the reach on him because all it is about is potential and you are passing up something proven to get him. Oh, MJ, this is where it gets so, so hard because you, you laid it out perfectly. Like, where would a day cost have gone? Like, you think back to that last year and I think he was as bad as hype as you could be. There was there was a more obvious path to half back by the time it became draft season. That was a real possibility, and, and I saw him sort of going in the sixty to seventies. And you flash forward one year, and that's an absolute steal. You know, yeah. you've got a top ten guy. You've got someone that looks like they're just going to be in and around that mark every single year. So I guess your question is: the, the guys that he's fighting with, if he wants to be a top fifty guy which we know we've spent a fair bit of time discussing mm -hmm. over the off-season doing the updated 50. And, and he's going to clash with these guys like a Jai Simpkin, like a Davies Uniac, like yeah. a Chad Warner. Golden. Now he's young. Exactly. And he's, he's obviously younger, which in a yes. league can be a good or a bad thing, depending where your team's at. <laughs> but I do think the scary thing with an Ashcroft that maybe some of those other guys might not have is he does have all the traits to be a 110 plus. And there's not many guys that can be a 110 plus. And for that reason, I think he has to be inside the top 40 picks for me. He's probably he's probably a fourth rounder, which which sounds insane to be in like in the 30s. Sure. But that is just the talent level you're getting. Yep. And, and the thing we always say with these guys is there's always going to be a buyer. There's always going to be a buyer with these type of guys. You know, if if a Warner stagnates off and he just, you know, he goes at 90 next year, all of a sudden people start thinking, oh, geez, he's so impactful, but he might not be that fantasy type of guy. You know, yeah. Jai Simkin, oh, he might just be that real solid, you know, low 100. This guy 
and everything we can see at this stage says he's a fantasy player. He's yeah. a magnet. Yeah. Like those are so hard pieces to get. Yeah. That I think I'd already have him in the top inside the top forty picks. What what about you, MJ? Because I know you think about this stuff a lot too. Yeah, I do. Look, I, I think you're you are reaching for him there. You're you're saying no to a lot of very good stuff. But if you're bullish on him, you have to probably use your fourth overall pick. Not fourth number pick, but fourth round selection if you really want to secure his services. Otherwise, with every round that passes, people go, oh, well, I take a Josh Ward. Oh, yeah, he had a good start. Oh, hang on. The best kid from the draft is sitting there. At, in dynasty leagues, it might be even higher up. So so these become factors for us. The one thing I will say where Ashcroft's value MJ would be probably almost top 15, top 20 already is a team that is down the bottom with yep. no prospects of winning in the next two to three years totally. and wants to do a full rebuild, clear out anyone that has current value for youth. Yep. I think to that team, yep. to that team that's not in the window, Ashcroft is a top Have a punt. 20. Yep. Because the, the players, when we did that 50, and people who've listened will know, that's the hardest thing with keepers. Yep. A Doherty to a contending team Huge. is a incredible pace you know a top 10 pace going yeah. into that's a weapon but if you're down the bottom Doherty's not serving you any good at all so no you're you're just gonna that's where now. that's where you can make these great trades isn't it, mj someone's now someone's yeah. future you can make these exchanges so for me yeah. if i'm just doing a fresh league and i'm sort of going for the now while looking at the future i think he's a top 40 yep if i'm in the window right now he's probably not in my top you know 100 50. picks because he's yeah, not really going to help me on field as much this year. But if I'm in the patient two or three years away, I think he could even yeah. be a top 15, 20 guy, yeah, which I makes that number really one pick. Like what? Ooh. I don't know what it would take for a lot of teams to move that. I don't think he could. Just... I, like if you're a seller dweller side, and unless you've got lucky and future traded into it, uh, like I'm in one of those positions. I play a number of keeper leagues, and I'm in one where I've got pick one. I was like, I, I genuinely don't know what someone – they even offered me a one ten mid, and I was like, you know what? They're late twenties. In five years, he might because be in that window. situation, MJ. Even if they offered you a lead, oh, what, yeah. what does lead do for you if you're well, in the rebuilding? A like dweller. by the time you get to cash in on how good lead is, you're like, I'm not set up to, for that. That's not Correct. helping me. No, it's so why no, Ashcroft it's, it's is one of the most valuable prospects for us. Look, we've done a good job talking about a very simple player selection for a it's good only been two minutes, hasn't it, MJ? Yeah, just been a hot minute, no problem at all. Thank you for your work on this one, Kay. No, pleasure, MJ. You're doing great. If you want to go and check out the article on Will and look through some of his junior stats line, as well as any of the other players we've revealed in the 50 most relevant, the good news is the article's online for you now at coachespanel.tv and the player podcasts of all the other 40 plus players we have revealed you can go and check them out wherever you're streaming this podcast in 30 seconds i'm going to give you a quick clue about who's at number six but if you are loving these podcasts or the articles as well as a bunch of other stuff that has been and will come shortly from us in the preseason we'd greatly appreciate it if you become a patreon supporter for just a few dollars a month it practically Practically helps us as a team be able to put that fresh fantasy AFL content in your hands, on your phones, and in your ears every single day of the preseason. So if you've loved what you've got from us this preseason for a couple of bucks a month, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. We'll kick you some extra content, hidden access groups, and more podcasts, including our top 50 keeper ranks. Kane and I did that in the off season. So if you're a bit of a keeper coach, you can go and check that out and see who we think are the best 50 players to own in a keeper league. Well, tomorrow we hit number six in the 50 most relevant. He's got 120 potential in AFL fantasy and dream team. He could well be the number one scorer in the game this year. I think he's got 115 ceiling in him in Supercoach. And I think he might just be able to be the number one player in his scoring line. So you hear that and you go, well, that better not be the mids if that's the output. And you're right. He is available to be selected 
somewhere outside of the midfield. You shouldn't be surprised with the last handful of players I reveal. But who fits that criteria? Tomorrow, I'll tell you on the 50 Most Relevant. <laughs> <laughs>